Next, we'll consider representing sets as ordered linked lists. So here's our second proposal. A set is represented by a linked list still. The elements are still unique, but the order of the elements is maintained from least to greatest. The point here is not to make sure that sets are ordered. It's still up to us in our representation how to order them, but instead to improve the order of growth for various set operations. So we're trying to make sets more efficient while still maintaining their general properties. So in particular, parts of the program that use sets to contain values still are going to assume that sets are unordered collections and won't make any assumptions about what order the elements are in if we iterate over them. And those parts of the program will use the functions empty, contains, adjoin, intersect, and union to manipulate sets. But the parts of the program that actually implement set operations will assume that sets are represented as linked lists where the elements are ordered from least to greatest. And that means they'll operate on those lists using first and rest and inequality or equality tests. There's an abstraction barrier here where we're separating the parts of the program that work with sets from the parts that implement their representation. And this is very typical in data abstraction that we'll have different parts of the program make different assumptions about the data. Okay, so the advantage of ordering the elements in a list is that we know something about the rest of the list just by looking at its first element. So let's say I have a set of the elements 1, 3, and 5, and here I've represented it as a linked list, which is a linked instance with its first element 1, etc. Um, and I'd like to perform the contains operation, so ask whether this list contains 1. Well, that's easy. We look at the first element, it's 1, and we're done. Whether it contains 2 is a different process, but it does avoid looking through the entire list. So we'll look at 1, see that that's not 2, so we'll look at the rest of the list. We'll see that its first element is 3, which is greater than 2. So we actually know that not only is 2 not in the list so far, but it's not in the rest of the list either. So we can stop at that point and return false, 2 is nowhere in this linked list. So performing the contains operation on a sorted representation of a set is faster in some cases because you can tell earlier on whether or not an element is in the list. If this wasn't sorted, we'd have to check the rest of the list to figure out whether this was 2 as well. Now the order of growth is still theta n. In the average case, assuming that v is either not in the list or it's in an arbitrary position throughout the list. But there is an efficiency effect. On average, if you keep take an arbitrary value that you search for, you're only going to have to search through maybe half the list before discovering that it's not there, rather than searching through the whole thing. That constant factor doesn't show up in theta notation, but it could be important in practice. Now let's look at adjoining an element to the set. So this means give me a set back that contains 1, 3, 5, and also 2. The way we'll adjoin is we'll construct a linked list that contains 1, 2, 3, and 5, and we have to construct it in that order to maintain our representation. So we'll take the number 2, see whether it's bigger or less than 1. Since it's larger, we want to insert 2 somewhere later on in the list. When we notice that the first element of the rest of the list is 3, we know we want 2 before 3 because it's less than. And then we have to go back and link on all of the elements that we uh, traversed as we were searching for the first element that was larger than the value we're inserting. So in this case, we would bind t to a linked list that shares the substructure 3, 5, but includes 1 and 2 rather than just 1 and keeps everything in sorted order. This operation is also theta n because most of the work is finding where you're going to insert, and then you build a linear length chain of link instances in order to represent the whole list. Let's implement both of these operations. 
So now we're going to represent sets as sorted sequences. The definition of empty is the same. Contains is a little bit faster. We can return false if s is empty or if it's the case that s.first is greater than v, because then we know that v doesn't appear anywhere in the rest of the list. Finally, we want to define a join. A join takes a list s, which is representing a set in sorted order. It takes a value v. If it's the case that s is empty, or it's the case that we found a point in the list where v is less than the first element in s, then what we need to do is construct a longer length list that has v as its first value and s as the rest of the list. On the other hand, if we find that v is already in the list, then we just return s because there's nothing to adjoin. And the last case is if v is greater than s.first. In this case, we're going to build a new linked list. It's not new because it has a different first element. It's instead new because v has been inserted somewhere in the middle of the list. And we perform that insertion by calling a join on s.rest using the value v. So now, if I have a set represented as this sorted linked list, I can figure out whether it contains 1, it does, 2, it does not. It also doesn't contain 6. If I adjoin s with the number 3, I get back the same structure I had before, but inserting 2 will place it in sorted order. Now notice that s is not changed. I've just created a new t, which uh, has 1, 2, 3, and 5 in it. If I also want it to contain 6, then I would adjoin t with the number 6, and 6 would be placed at the end. Whereas if I had adjoined 0, that would be placed at the beginning.